the human rights movement is facing a crisis. From escalating conflicts and genocide to democratic backsliding, basic human rights and civil liberties are under assault worldwide. Long-standing international institutions meant to defend these freedoms are themselves being called into question. Yet even as the threats mount, there are leaders refusing to abandon the vital cause of upholding human dignity and justice for all people. Visionaries who see a way forward even amid the tumult. Today on Pushback Talks, we sit down with one such voice. And what a voice it is. Volker Turk, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. From this globally influential platform, Turk is a moral force and staunch advocate for protecting human rights in an increasingly hostile landscape. His conversation with Frederick and Leilani explores both the monumental challenges facing the modern human rights movement and Turk's boldly optimistic ideas for meeting them. He lays out his vision for pioneering human rights economies, a revolutionary economic framework centered on human well-being rather than unchecked profits. They discuss innovative concepts like integrating human rights into economic policymaking, using existing legal tools to hold abusers accountable, and affirming the indispensable role of the United Nations, despite its flaws. Join us in our season finale for a candid dialogue on fortifying human rights through transformative, outside-the-box thinking. At a moment when our fundamental freedoms are under siege, Volker Turk shares his powerful perspective on defending these liberties and building a more just world. This is Pushback Talks. I'm Frederick Gerten, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And this is Pushback Talks. And, and uh, yeah, what a day. What a day. It's uh, actually super interesting times to be a filmmaker and an advocate because things are happening. Human rights are, everybody's talking about human rights and you are a human rights lawyer, Leilani. And my films could maybe be labeled as uh, some kind of interest in human rights. What do you say about uh, human rights in our era? It's kind of... I know, it's becoming mainstream. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to hide any longer. <laughs> it's headline news. And our podcast is coming out almost every second week. If you like it... You should rate it. That's really important. You should make some comments, tell your friends about it. This is very, really important. People tell us that if you want your podcast to grow, you have to, you would need more interaction with listeners. And we know we have listeners because we get stats on people downloading the app. And, and, and it's still from all over the world, 161 countries, which is kind of cool. Very cool. Very, very global. So anyway, we should, I guess, go to to our special guest today, Leilani. Who are we going to invite to our show today? We have a super special guest. The leader, the world leader in human rights, Mr. Volker Turk, who is the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the United Nations in Geneva. And we're super lucky to have him join us I don't think we've had someone quite at his level in the human rights world before. So, uh, and, you know, with what's going on in the world right now, his role is super important. And I'm sure he's under a lot of pressure and stress. <laughs> yeah, because the, 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 a lot of people love the UN, but some others don't love the UN. That's what we, we notice also these days. I mean, this has also been your story, Leilani, as, as a UN special rapporteur, that you get a lot of respect, but sometimes people don't really listen to you anyway. I think that's right. I think the UN has long been a fragile um, entity, a fragile organization. I think you expose that and push the film, you know, when I'm speaking and state delegates are on their iPhones uh, looking at watches that they'd like to purchase. Uh, so there's always been that watches, expensive yeah. watches, excuse me. Yeah. Mm. So there's always been that fragility. And I think since the events of October 7th and thereafter in uh, Israel and Palestine, um, I think there's been a lot of questions around whether the UN is dead 
basically. You know, does it have any power at all? Uh, in light of the U.S.'s veto power, for example, at the Security Council, um, I know that people in the Global South in particular have a lot of question marks around whether the U.N. was ever established for them in a, in a meaningful way, in a positive way. That's a very that's a very good question to the UN to to Volker Turk. So looking forward to put that question. But I mean, since the International Criminal Court said that they might send out a warrant for Netanyahu and his for, for defense minister and for the Hamas leadership, it's it's getting really hot. It it certainly is. And and let's talk to Volker about that. The meaning significance. Um, are we in a different era? Is Are we suddenly back in the human rights game? Does it have uh, some power that has been lacking in the last however long? Well, certainly the last seven months. But, uh, you know, is this a game changer? And, I mean, you know, it would be nice to know from people in the Global South how they're reacting. Uh, I certainly have seen some comments from Palestinians, which I can relay. But, uh, uh, yeah. It's easy to become cynical and say it doesn't mean a shit, but I think it means something because the it, the moral gap become, becomes very visible and I think it's it's important to show uh, this gap. And I, that's what I do in my films, that's what you do in, in your work and I guess also what, what Falker is doing. Well, yeah. let's let's bring him in. Welcome to Pushback Talks, uh, Folke Turk. Uh, it's r- an honor for us to, to have you on. And as I've been working with Leilani now for quite a few years, uh, she has taught me a lot about human rights law. But Leilani, why is Folker so important? He's the human rights chief of the world right now. And uh, we are in perhaps unprecedented times with respect to human rights both in terms of their fragility and their necessity. And so we're super honored to have Volker, to have you with us today. A big welcome and a warm welcome. Yeah, very happy to be with with both of you. And it's great to see you again, Lilali. So, I mean, both of you, your work on this in the, within the UN system, Leilani also, and and uh, you're, you're facing all these horrible things that are happening in the world. So how do you how do you keep your s- smiles up? It must be quite tough, a tough job. Look, I mean, it is true. We are at a time of unprecedented crisis when it comes to many things, including human rights. But at the same time, we are better off than people during the 19th, 19th and 20th century because we actually have the law on our side. And we have a normative framework that was drafted in the wake of the Second World War that gives us incredible tools. And within all the doom and gloom and the violations that we see, let's not forget that we actually can use these tools and we must use these tools all the time. And that actually gives us strength. I have seen, and that keeps me going, I have seen incredible success stories as well. I mean, they are not necessarily the big ones that you see on the news, but we have seen massive changes in attitudes, in policies, in legislation that advance human rights. And so it's really important to constantly recall the achievements of the human rights movement, of the norms, of of the whole system that has been established and and build on it and, and frankly learn also for the current challenges and for the future challenges. And I think that's really what keeps me going. Hmm. Yeah. And, and now the International Criminal Court came out with quite a statement that is some people, Leilani, on your side maybe will say it's not enough, it won't help the Palestinians, but at the same time it's, it's a big thing. It's a big thing, uh, for sure. Yeah. It's a big thing. I just want to, before I pass back to Volker on the ICC. I just want to say about international law and sort of why I continue to get up every morning and fight for it. I mean, the law isn't the problem. The law is beautiful. 
and if it were fully implemented, if, if the full panoply of human rights were fully implemented, the world would be an incredibly beautiful place, a more peaceful place. People would be happier. There would be more human well-being. There's no doubt about this. And that was the vision after World War II when we had reached rock bottom, a kind of moral bankruptcy, a kind of incredible destabilization of the world. That was the vision. And so there's nothing wrong with the law and the standards that attach to the law. What the problem is that we all recognize is is patchy implementation is impunity for violations. And so then that gets us to the relevance and importance of this ICC move to actually say, we're here and we are going to hold actors accountable for egregious actions. And so, Volker, what are you thinking about the ICC move? Well, it's, it's first of all, I think it's also important for the audience to understand it's the first move in a long process. And it's important to, to bear that in mind, but it's an important move by the prosecutor to ask, essentially, the pretrial chamber to see whether the arrest warrants can go forward. And he has, as you know, benefited also from the advice of, an, of independent experts. So it's not just the evidence that he has brought together, but it's also l- eminent lawyers who have advised him. And he puts forward a strong case, both in relation to key leaders of Hamas and also key leadership in, in Israel to to say that arrest warrants are needed. And now we have to see how the pretrial chamber is, is going to take the decision on this. I mean, as you know, I myself have been very clear about a number of things that have been happening over the last couple of months, both in relation to what Hamas, what the, I should say, what the uh, armed groups, I mean, the, the military wing did and, and some of the other armed groups, but also what Israel did. And one of the big issues that we have been facing over the last couple of decades, frankly, in relation to this conflict is actually impunity and lack of accountability. So it is really important if there's any one single lesson to be learned from all of this is to actually make sure that accountability is strengthened and that justice is served, because that's also what the survivors and the victims on both sides need. And not just in relation to this conflict, but frankly, in each and every conflict around the world. Mm. But in some way, it's also put the UN in the middle of the conflict. I mean, a lot of people will say, I, we don't respect the UN, we don't care about the UN, or the UN is side, sided with only one side. So, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on you, you guys. Look, I think it's important when we talk about the UN, there is, if, again, if I may uh, go into a bit more deeply into this, the UN has different faces and different if you like, uh, dimensions. I mean, the humanitarian dimension has always worked in all these type of situations where, frankly, we have many of my colleagues have lost their lives or they they were in a serious, exceptionally difficult security situation. I mean, we had now over almost close to 200 people who lost their lives in Gaza who were killed. And, I mean, we have this in other conflict situations too, And it shows that the UN is actually on the ground trying to do the right thing, trying to deliver humanitarian assistance. My colleagues from the Human Rights Office, and Leilani knows this very well when she was a special rapporteur, our job is to monitor, to document, to report, is also to raise awareness, is to engage with a wide range of actors, member states, non-state actors, businesses, to actually make them aware that there is this human rights dimension. But then there's the whole development work of the United Nations. And then there is, of course, the Security Council. And the Security Council is, is a member state-driven body. It has got nothing to do with the, with the other side of the UN. And that really, as we know, is pretty dysfunctional as we, as, as we speak. Mm, I think that's such an important distinction you've made there about the different sort of bodies and organs within the UN. Um, because I do, I have heard people saying, you know, the UN system was built for Northern Western 
nations. And I don't think that's quite accurate. And certainly I feel, and maybe because I was a special procedure, I think the special procedures, for example, play a hugely important role of this monitoring, independent assessment evaluation of state action and other actors as well. And then, of course, the humanitarian side, as you so so well put, is absolutely essential globally and has been and will continue to be. Uh And certainly the people in Gaza know very well how important the UN and humanitarian aid is and do not speak Mm. poorly of that. And so I think that it's important to remember there's a political arm of the UN or side to the UN that, yes, is clearly problematic, at least for the last seven months. We've seen how problematic it is, but there are other instances where it's been problematic and maybe some reforms are necessary there. But to, to dismiss the entire UN seems to me... Well, not appropriate. <laughs> of course, I'm still wedded, even though I'm no longer a rapporteur. Mm. I am. I remain wedded. And I think what we see now is, to me, what's happening right now in Gaza, but in Sudan and other places, Congo, is what happens when we don't adhere to human rights. Right. So where where are we left? Like, if you're going to just abandon the UN, uh-huh. where does that leave us? To me, there, it really uh-huh. leaves us nowhere and nowhere good. Yeah, fully agreed. Yeah. When I've been following you on Twitter, uh, I can see that you've been around. You've been in <laughs> Chile recently, where I, I also was there recently with my film. I've seen you've been to Africa, to DRC, mm-hmm. and to, to Sahel. And when, you, when you're out there, you will also meet a different view of, of yeah. the UN or of the global system, where yeah. a lot of people feel that there is like a human rights are good for some, but not for all. You know, it's like the the double standards of the world that is kind of, it's very, that conflict is growing right now, uh, yeah. that you see the students in the US are protesting and so on. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you counter that when you meet it? Look, I think when I was in the eastern part of Congo, there was one thing that really stayed with me. We all have mobile phones, right? We all greatly benefit from them. We couldn't even imagine a life without them. (laughs) And then where do the resources that make up our mobile phones come from? 40% of the the world resources of coltan, which is a very important ingredient for mobile phones, is actually emerged, comes from the eastern part of, of DRC. When you see how people live there, incredible impoverished, in, in abject poverty. I mean, I, I was in two IDP, in, in two camps where you had internally displaced people because of all the warfare that is going on. And it's a warfare around resources and access to resources. The people are suffering to a point that breaks my heart. And I mean, I was there many times in previous positions And I see the same, and nothing changes. It also shows the interconnectedness of our lives, right? We don't think, people in the West don't think about what's happening in the eastern part of Congo, despite the fact that their own benefits of life are directly linked to what's happening there. So there is, we need to have much more awareness of what is happening all around the world so that we can actually change something for the better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Chile is the other example. So I visited the museum, the memory museum, the Museo de de la Memoria. Memoria, yeah. And it reminded me if dictatorships, military, you know, uh, coups lead to massive human rights violations. And if the history is not at the forefront of the present and of how we tackle the future, we will repeat the same mistakes. And that's a huge, important, a hugely important lesson from, from the human rights side, because then we go back to the old habits and, you know, we, we then adopt laws again where the use of force, as was done in Chile, was adopted by Congress, which struck down the criterion of proportionality, for example. So it's mm. so important everywhere in the world to know about history, to know about the interconnectedness, and to, to know about how it affects people directly, our lifestyles, whatever we do, however we act. And 
I think that's the awareness that human rights can bring to the table. I think it's when I'm reading your your different posts on on Twitter, it's it's like almost like a documentary film festival. Different <laughs> uh, different patterns. You, it's climate ju- justice. Yeah. It's attacks on the press. It's uh, impunity in Chile. It's the the killed human rights defenders, mostly of them environmental, meaning mainly mainly of them are First Nation people. Equal yes. rights for women. It's about the plastic, and and uh, and the LBG. IQ and then yeah. the religious hatred you're addressing. I mean, so you're into this every day. Uh, all those important uh, matters. How how can how can you how do you handle this? I mean, if you, I guess you've been in this for a long time. But how yeah. do we as human beings uh, handle this? Where do you, where do you find the inspiration? Look, I think it's really important to see human rights not in a reduced manner, which sometimes happens. We see human rights either as a violation or we see it as doom and gloom, or we see it as civil and political rights. But it's, it is that as well. But it's also a solution. It also guides us. It wants to inspire us. It wants to capture the imagination of people, as we see with young people. You know, the social movements around the world, feminism, LGBTQ+, Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future. I mean, these are all uh, social movements that that were actually human rights movements, decolonization, the anti-apartheid struggle. So you, you continue. So it is true that social movements has always been the yearning for more freedom, for, for a change, for transformations in lives. And the vision of human rights is so important to influence politics, to influence actually even political debates. I would really encourage, because we have so many elections going on this year, I would really encourage people who go to vote to see what type of programs and projects political parties put forward, and they should look at it from a human rights perspective. Does it exclude people? Does it discriminate against people? Does it dehumanize people? Does it actually promote equality? Does it counter poverty? Does it address adequate housing for people, which is a big concern everywhere, but also now increasingly in the industrialized world. So I would really encourage people to, to embrace human rights as a guide, as an inspiration, but also as a decision-making point when it comes in particular to politics. This is really cool. We have to save this part and, and, and show because we, we have some important elections in here in Europe now, the 9th of yes. June, where we know that... If we mobilize people to vote uh, against the right wing, uh, it, it makes yeah. a difference because the right wing is are gaining strength here, and it's like it's the worst candidates that that, are, that they are presenting. So it's it, it's a bit scary. Yeah, and if Frederick, if I could just say, because you're yeah. talking about the parliamentary elections, the upcoming mm. parliamentary elections mm. in the European Union, mm. what I see happening is that the migration topic and the refugee topic becomes the type of thing that wants to create divisions and polarizations within the political debate. And it's often not done on, based on evidence, and it's often not done based on, on a human rights approach. And yet, the same parties that are promoting the dehumanization of migrants and refugees are the ones who are going to dehumanize other portions of, of their own societies, if we are not careful. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an early warning signal again, from a human rights perspective, to be very astute politically when it comes to these things. Mm. And it's also important for us to mobilize as much as we can. And and I'm happy to have both of you on here because you're important players. Uh, Volker, you're talking about the human rights economy as a political tool for for governments and others. Can you tell us about this idea? So we launched it last year and... At, in its essence, it means that economic systems that haven't really served the planet nor the people need to be undergoing a massive paradigm shift. It means that they have to serve and they have to actually serve the rights of people. And if you divorce economic policies from human rights, we will see the results. We will actually see what has led to 
the triple planetary crisis, climate change, environmental pollution, uh, loss of biodiversity. But if we actually, again, look at economic policies and macroeconomic policies, fiscal policies, monetary policies, uh, budget decisions from a human rights perspective, it is a different prism. It actually makes food, right to food, right to water, right to adequate housing, to social protection issues that the state has to provide because of its obligations. So it is a different way of looking again at, at a whole realm of politics that would otherwise not be, not be considered. So I, and I, I know that Leilani has worked very hard, especially on, the, on, the, on one particular aspect, which is so critical, which is housing. And there are huge political ramifications if it's not addressed. So as I see your work, Leilani, is to, to make un- governments better understand how to implement human rights law in their in their policies, and you are, you yeah. also advise governments. Uh, absolutely, and Volker's work on the human rights economy has been really important to moving forward my work. I have to say because it situates my idea. And it's not just my idea; it's the human rights imperative, which is that housing is home and not a commodity. And not of tool, exactly. uh, not a tool of neoliberalism, and so the idea of a human rights economy. I can slot my work mm. on housing right into what Volker is proposing, where our economies should produce human rights outcomes. As he said earlier, human rights are a solution, and. and uh, the work on the human rights economy situates human rights as the outcome that our economies should be achieving. And so governments can't just leave things to the market and allow the market to do what markets will do, which we know what markets will do. We know exactly what they will do. Housing is a very good example. Markets will create homelessness, for example. That's what they do. And so... This work is super important, Volker, and I'm hoping it's going well. I'm interested to hear how states, because presumably you're interacting with states on the human rights economy, are they embracing it? I mean, obviously, what you're suggesting is a fundamental paradigmatic shift. Um, So how are states interacting with your proposals? So it's interesting... And I'll start first with economists, because we, we convened a number of very famous economists. And, and for them to actually look at economic systems from a human rights perspective was a novelty. And it surprised me. Yeah. So I asked them, actually, when you study macroeconomics or business or in business schools, do you learn about human? Do you actually teach human rights? They said, no. It, I think it was more in the past than it is now that actually those who become economists of today are not necessarily very knowledgeable about human rights. And it is so important that they are. And, you know, for instance, a fantastic economist, Mariana Mazzucato, I mean, we had a discussion with her, and she has this concept of the mission economy, which really tallies so well with, with our human rights economy concept. So I can see that the progressive economists really embrace this idea. When it comes to member states... I think there are, they take different bits and pieces of it. For example, many countries in the developing world who are suffering from huge debt repayment issues, not least as a result also of COVID, you know, the special drawing rights actually only benefited high-income countries. It, well, there was a recent decision by the IMF to redistribute some of it, which is, which is good, but let's see how it works. But that's at least a very a step in the right direction. But you don't... I mean, they are suffering from huge debt repayments, so they can't invest enough in education, healthcare, social protection, uh, some of the fundamentals of what an adequate standard of living is. And they see us as an ally because we would sometimes, in some country situations, we have had, we have been doing this, for instance, in Zambia, uh, but also in, in Jordan, in Kenya where we get involved with our own economists, and we have recruited economists in in my office who do budget analysis from a human rights perspective, where some of the budget decisions would actually come out differently if you look at 
what type of submissions do you make to parliaments? And not just in the developing world. I, I had a former minister of finance from the Netherlands. When she met me last year, she was telling me she was so fascinated by the concept that she asked her staff to look at the budget submission that they were going to make to parliament from the perspective of human rights obligations. And it adjusted some of the resource allocation, because fundamentally resource allocation are decisions about human rights. And, I think this and that's is, key. Yeah. It, it's super interesting. And I, I read your speech in New York for the 75 years of the of the Declaration of Human Rights. And, and I recommend our, we will put it up so people can read it. It's it's very interesting. And it's kind of also close to my, my last film, Breaking Social, which is also covering more or less the same themes. But one of the themes in that film is also how the super rich yeah. are buying into countering what you are talking about. So they, they will buy legislation that goes their way. So in some way, what you are proposing here is super important but how can we strengthen it yeah because we are up against really powerful entities no i think again it has to be translated into politics i mean for me political programs in the future if they don't have sustainable development and human rights based development at their core i think there should be some real questioning about that what we see is of course politics of distraction you know we see debates about non-issues that are not important. We don't see the real debates about, you know, the big challenges of, of, of our times. And they need to play a role in political debate. And, and that's what we miss, frankly. So we need to work a lot more on political awareness, on political mobilization, but also on a, on a more in-depth knowledge of, of all these issues and, and how they come together and and how they influence fundamental political decisions that everyone wants to see happen, but which are sometimes captured by, yes, by elites, by economic and political elites who are very good at distracting us from the real issues. Certainly. And it, it seems like in this time, the divide is growing because you can see big organizations like Oxfam and others are highlighting this divide. And, and I think the arguments are really clear that is the, the rich should participate more and be more responsible. Do you, can you see that we are in that sense also, because the, I, my feeling is that the, the public debate is going in the right way. Can you feel that we are getting closer to actually turn around something? I mean, I, I think we are, in a very, we are in a very, very difficult moment. I, I would not underestimate that. But I do have... I mean, whenever I talk also to young people in particular, there is this yearning to fundamentally change everything and to make it better. And I think the elites, some of the elites are pretty wary of it. So they will use, and we saw it with the carbon, with the carbon, the fossil, the, the carbon industry. I mean, look at some of the COPs, I mean, the conference of parties on that are taking place on an annual basis on climate change. I mean, they are trying to infiltrate <laughs> and, and, and as a big business, especially the carbon industry, is, is really trying to influence this as much as they can. It's only possible to counter it if there is a groundswell of support that things have to change mm -hmm. on, on the climate front, for example. The fact that you had young people demonstrating Fridays for Future was a game changer. It, I mean, even if people maybe don't see it immediately, it did change things. But that, that battle, <laughs> that battle of young people, of, of all of us who, who see this coming, that has to continue and it has to be much stronger. And it, it will help us push back against big business interests that are totally out of date in today's world. And again, the human rights economy helps us for that. Melanie. Mm. Well, there's so much that's uh, rich that has been just said. I just want to uh, re-emphasize that what your work, Volker, is doing is putting things like food, housing, health care on political agendas in a new way, um, in a way that should always have been but hasn't, yeah. especially with neoliberal economic agendas. And... 
you know, as someone who's worked in the area of economic, social, and cultural rights all of my working life, I know the second class status they still have as compared to other human rights. And this human rights economy approach really forces that conversation to say, okay, it's not, it's not cool anymore. It never was cool, but it's really, it has to be addressed now. And these are human rights and they have to be fulfilled. Um, so I, I, I just want to underscore how important that is because yeah. this is a, you know, we can't continue. We're, we are on an unsustainable path. We know that with respect to climate. I don't think people realize the unsustainable path we're on with respect to things mm-hmm. like food security, housing security, lack of access to proper health care, et cetera. So, so just to say that. And th- the other thing, and this brings us almost full circle, but... I completely agree with you about the need for this groundswell. And I think if there are some silver linings or positive things that we've learned in the last seven months as an advocate, I've been a lifelong advocate and I I have learned more in the last seven months, I think, than, than the rest of my years. It takes a huge effort to make change. Look at what we've witnessed, glo- literally global protests. That's what we've seen. And, and, Every strategy has been used. Litigation, campaigning, petitions, walking on the streets, you know, knocking on political doors. I mean, every strategy is being used. And that's why we're seeing change. That's why we're seeing the ICC move, the the International Court of Justice move, right? So we we need young people because I know people like me were old and tired. (laughs) We need the young people and their energy and we need this diversity of strategies if we're really going to address economies that aren't producing human well-being. And it's a huge work, right? Huge work. I fully agree. And it actually brings me back to one thing that you have been working on for for such a long time, and it is housing. Because housing, of course, there's the right to housing, but we also know that it's sometimes underestimated, if you don't address it properly, you will disadvantage parts of society that will have to grapple with with survival. And, And some of them, because they will become so disillusioned, may actually fall prey to populism. Yeah. And, right. and we saw it in the interwar period in Europe, housing was part of, and the lack of social protection were part of the lure that the far right had, uh, the lack of housing. I mean, the fact that you had yes. such a disillusioned population, so they were longing for some of the absolutely horrific promises that populism and and far-right politics were offering them. So it is an important aspect of prevention. Yes, and it links to what you were saying before. Housing has become the issue that is being attached to uh, migrants and refugees. So now the populist movements are saying, oh, the housing crisis, that's because of migrants and refugees. So it is dovetailing exactly as you say. It is a real threat. If it's not addressed, it's a real threat. Mm. And then I made two films about these issues. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, we are addressing it, but it's uh, we need more. And I think, Leilani, to you, we, we need young people, but we also need... Uh, we need everybody, you know. I, of course. We shouldn't leave it all to the young. No, I think but the we need their energy. We I need, ride on their energy. <laughs> absolutely. No, it's, it's a big inspiration. And, but we also have to give something to them. I mean, so it's not yes. only one-way show. Uh, Folker, I guess you are are busy to run into the next meetings. I don't know what, or I hope you, you could have a walk in the sun around the Lake of Geneva or something, but <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs> Well, I, you know, nature gives us and nourishes us every day, and we have to be absolutely grateful for this. And we need to make sure that we can live with the planet, and our not our not only our young people, but also future generations can benefit from exactly what we have benefited from. And that's really what human rights is all about. Beautiful. Thank you very much to both of you. What a nice, what a nice way to end. I love <laughs> that. Beautiful. I'm with you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Volker, to, for for being on on our podcast, and good luck with your important work. 
we will follow and hope we can spread the word about your work too because it's yeah. n- it needs to be out there yeah. thank you very much to, yeah. to both you. you and Leilani yeah thanks Volker bye 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 Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. To support the podcast, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash pushbacktalks. Follow us on social media at make underscore the shift and push underscore the film. Or check out our websites, maketheshift.org, pushthefilm.com, or breakingsocialfilm.com.